All right, welcome back. So I wanted to go over some of the critical, I guess, or easy to misunderstand parts of the corn shell, even if you read the manual page. <clears throat> I'm getting at the point now where if you wanna become really good at shell scripting, you're gonna to need to read the manual page. <clears throat> but I wanna go over some of the things that even if you do read the manual page, might not be obvious to you. And <clears throat> I'll just say that one of the things about the manual page is that it's kind of long. I have created a repo, which you can find at my GitHub, github.com slash ccwadi, and it's just titled KSH or maybe KSH man, but <clears throat> it has everything that's in this directory, which is just the manual page split up into shorter sections. And it has a subdirectory with all of the formatting from the manual pages removed so that you can view it in a normal text editor. <clears throat> and uh, if you do an ls-1 in this directory, it will list them in <clears throat> the order that they appear in the manual page. There's one section, at the stuff at the very end I didn't include because it's not very important for me because I don't do VI editing mode, I do Emacs editing mode. But <clears throat> if you, uh, Are running shell scripts, uh, the first thing that I'll say that is implied by the introduction is that <clears throat> your profile, which is where you have all of your uh, customizations, like I have here, that will not be read if you just run a non-login shell. So if I just type KSH, that will run a new version of the corn shell, and that's not gonna read any of my customizations. <clears throat> Similarly, you can create shell scripts like I have here, and that won't run any of your customizations. So you can see the only aliases that I have loaded are the default ones that are included by a normal corn shell. And if you, as an aside, if you wanna create a shell script that you can just run by typing the name of the file, you can do that just by doing hash exclamation point slash bin KSH, then the shell script that you wanna run and then after you've, you're done doing that, you'll need to do uh, chmod, and then <clears throat> at least if it's a file that you own, u plus x. So you can see if I do an ls-l of test, the user is allowed to execute this file. So that's just an aside. But <clears throat> the next thing that I'll mention in the syntax section is that the general structure of commands is that you have simple commands and complex commands. Simple commands are either shell built-ins or <clears throat> functions that you've defined or an external command. And then there's complex commands, which are the control flow commands, essentially, that are listed here. And you should read all about these. <clears throat> it's not very long, it doesn't, won't take you that long. But the lowest level is a command, which is either a simple command or a complex command. And those can be chained together with pipes into pipelines as mentioned uh, here. And then uh, lists of commands can be created by separating pipelines or just regular commands, either complex or simple by these tokens. And uh, this section will mention what those tokens do. 
And <clears throat> that's pretty much it for this section. The one other thing that I'll mention is that this shell does not execute these complex commands in a subshell when one or more of their file descriptors are redirected. So if we look here in RC, you can see that we have file redirection done on this complex command. And file redirection on a complex command has to be done after it. But essentially what this will do is it will force whatever is in this section between the while and the do to read its standard input from this file that's found by substituting this dollar sign. And <clears throat> if you're going to be changing environment variables, that won't happen if your shell runs things in a subshell. So it won't be passed to the parent shell. Now, subshells are different from newly executed shells that I mentioned just a moment ago in that at the moment that the subshell is started, it's almost exactly the same as the parent shell, which means any configuration that you have run, any configuration that you have will still be there. So I can run G status in a subshell and it will still recognize that I have G aliased to get no pager. But <clears throat> That's pretty much it for the command section. The one other thing that I'll mention is that for functions, as you can see here, the arguments to the function are referenced with dollar sign one for the first argument, two for the second, etc. And then dollar sign 10 you would reference by doing that if you happen to have a command that had 10 arguments or more. So <clears throat> that's it for that section. The next thing that I will mention is IFS whitespace. So whenever you do any form of substitution, whether it's parameter substitution, command substitution, or arithmetic substitution, if you don't do that substitution in double quotes, it's subject to IFS field splitting. So field splitting will split the output of that substitution into separate arguments based on the values of the IFS parameter. So <clears throat> this specifies a list of characters which are used to break a string up into several words. By default, or if IFS is not set, it just uses space, tab, and new line. And those are also special because they're called IFS whitespace. And one or more IFS whitespace characters in a row do not create empty fields. Other characters will delimit empty fields. And <clears throat> at the beginning of a string, leading non-IFS whitespace does create an empty field. So as an example, let's uh, see what my IFS is set to right now. Okay, so it's currently set to the default. And just to make sure I can unset it to make this totally clear. And <clears throat> I will use the dot print arc V function that I have created to show you <clears throat> what's going on here. But if I do an echo, and suppose I even do this in quotes. Uh, there we go. Some spaces here. You can see that this trims all of this leading white space, all of this intermediary white space, and all of the trailing white space. So the arguments that I get are just some spaces and here. If I put this in quotes again, I will get just one argument with all of the spaces preserved because IFS whitespace is not done on this. 
And if I set IFS to, let's say, a space followed by a colon, then doing something like ugh, this will create an empty field before this first colon because it's non-IFS white space and it will create an empty field between the two and then it will create one field but it will trim all of the leading spaces from this so this second colon and the rest of the spaces delimit one field and then all of these spaces delimit fields between sum and spaces these spaces delimit fields between sum and here and then if we put a single colon at the end here you'll see that <clears throat> we hmm, why did this only give me one that's interesting so it should have given me two let's if I put spaces here I get the same thing that's interesting I wonder if it's because I'm putting all of this in quotes. Nope. Interesting. But in any case, this will create one empty field at the very beginning. And then the rest of the spaces are delimiting just fields. And at the end, it doesn't create a new field either. I would have to put a second Thing there to get an empty field at the very end. So <clears throat> just be aware of IFS whitespace. Also, I will mention that if you're going to use backticks for command substitution, don't use them to <clears throat> don't use them if you're going to have to have command substitution within command substitution, or if you really need to quote anything, because it's crazy. It's ridiculous. I'll do a totally separate video on the ridiculousness of backtick substitution. But <clears throat> I believe that's all that there really is to cover in this section. Parameters. I've mentioned pretty much everything that I think is worth mentioning for parameters. Just read this manual page section. It's not terribly long, 394 lines. So <clears throat> read that to get an idea of what's going on there. I've mentioned everything that I think is important for tilde brace expansion and pattern. Read the manual page for full details, but there's nothing particularly complicated there. Redirection, I've mentioned, but you can get more details by reading this as well as just by looking at some code. So if we go to RC, there will surely be a section. Yeah, so you can see here, you can redirect non, you can redirect standard error to DevNull by just prefixing this with a two and then Let's just search for a slash dev null. Yeah, so here you can see they're redirecting standard input or standard output to dev null, and then they're making <clears throat> standard error copy standard input. So standard error also goes to dev null. File descriptor two here is just another name for file descriptor one in this case after you do this, but you have to do this in this order. So and then uh, read the manual section on math to get an idea of what's going on there. Functions I've mentioned uh, and uh, I think you know you just have to read this and don't read it all at once just read it as you come across commands that don't have a manual page because if you come across a command that doesn't have a manual page it's probably something that is a built-in shell function and the description will be in here so jobs 
enable you to run things in the background and you can run a bunch of different things in the background. So just read this. You really don't need to use this much if you're running Tmux. And that's it. So if you like this video, hit like. If you dislike this video, hit dislike. And if you did either of those things, leave a comment letting me know why. Uh, also, if you've got any questions, criticisms, or concerns, leave a comment down below for that as well. And as always, if you want to get notified when I make new videos, hit subscribe. Thanks. Peace.